In the years immediately following the defeat of the Nazis after World War II, Germany underwent massive changes to its political and economic systems, as well as to its borders. The victorious powers of the war, the US, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union, could not agree on the fate of Germany. For the time being, they had divided the country into separate territories. Western Germany included the US, British, and French sectors, while the East contained the Soviet sector. Britain, France, and the US supported a democratic Germany which would be reindustrialized into its former state. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin took a radically different stance. He reasoned that Germany should make reparations to the Soviet Union for damages inflicted during the war. The Soviets stressed that such reparations were requisites before Germany would be allowed to be reunified, so they wanted the reunification to occur under their control so as to limit its military capacities. The differences created much tension between the Soviet and Western allies, and relations began to deteriorate. In accordance with the 1945 Potsdam Agreement calling for the reunification of Germany, the Allied Council of Foreign Ministers met in London during February and March of 1948 to discuss the situation. By December of that year, they had authorized a plan for the forming of a provisional government to govern West Germany. When it came to reunification, the attitude was that the Soviet East would accept the government later on, or in other words, take it or leave it. Meanwhile, the British and U.S. governments moved to introduce a new Deutschmark currency to West Germany. These actions alienated relations with the Soviets, who had not only lost their chance to control Germany, but were also cut out from the Allied negotiating table. Stalin finally broke when U.S. President Harry Truman refused to give the Soviets reparations from West German industrial plants, even though it was required under the Potsdam Agreement. Upon Truman's refusal, Stalin ordered the separation of East Germany from West Germany and the formation of a communist East government. This act created what were to become two separate countries, East and West Germany. There was, however, a problem with the situation. The former German capital, Berlin, was located in the Soviet's eastern territory, surrounded on all sides. Berlin itself was a city divided with Soviet, American, British, and French sectors. When Germany divided, so too did Berlin. This meant that Allied Berlin was separated from the rest of the West and was therefore at the mercy of the Soviets. While Western powers were occupied creating new countries, the Soviets were also busy annexing them or at least trying to. The Soviet takeover of the Czech Republic in mid-1948 came as a big shock to the Western powers. However, when the Soviets learned of plans for the formation of West Germany, they realized that a separated Germany was not in their best interests. So they proceeded to put as much pressure as possible on the Allies in the one place that they could, Berlin. Starting in April of 1948, the Soviets forced inspection of Allied trains and crew and required permits for freight trains moving to and from Berlin. These actions were not only unnecessary, but were also in direct violation of previous agreements on such matters. The Soviets finally closed all ground routes into West Berlin on June 24th. This move clearly intimated that the Soviets wanted to take all of Berlin for themselves. Allied leaders attempted diplomacy, but their efforts turned to be ineffectual. Since Berlin's civilian population relied extensively on outside sources for their needs, the city only had about a month's supply of food and fuel. Western leaders began planning for ground invasions to help resupply Berlin. The most peaceful of such involved sending an armored convoy up the Autobahn that would be peaceful unless attacked. Tensions ran high. We expected that the Allies could introduce the army and that some military units might accompany trains and cars. And we realized what might be the result. There might be some accidents with the soldiers and it might be used to start a fight between the armies. We felt it and we had a directive from Moscow to have our families leave Berlin. The families should leave only in the case of necessity Families, children, wives should be evacuated. That was the situation. Given the circumstances, Allied leaders needed another method and their answer came in the form of an airlift. 
the Berlin Airlift officially began on June 25, 1948. Operation Vittles, as it was codenamed, was directed by Lieutenant General William H. Tonner and was a joint effort between the U.S. and British Royal Air Forces. Not only was the airlift an effort to supply Berlin's population of 2.25 million, but it was also a public humiliation for the Soviets. Experts determined that the city of Berlin required 3,475 tons of daily supplies to survive. In addition to this, the sick would need evacuation on return flights because medical supplies were not always available. Soviet military administrator Mikhail Semeriga said that he was impressed with the coordination of the airlift. He said that the Americans brought not only bread, meat, milk, but they even brought coal, wood, and anything, and they saved the situation. The main planes used during the airlift were the Douglas C-47, the C-54, and the British Sutherland flying boat. Sometimes other types were used as well. Initially, the planes flew 24 hours a day, seven days a week, along three major air corridors to and from three landing locations in Berlin. Tempelhof Airport in the American sector, and Gatau Airport in Lake Havel in the British sector. Later on, the routes were revised due to safety measures, with only two routes of entry and a central route of exit. Along with this change came the addition of the Tegel Airport as the delivery zone, as well as many other airports of takeoff. Planes were spaced three minutes apart and were guided by radio signals set up to help them along their way. Despite all the safety efforts that were made, there were still cr crashes. The airlift claimed 101 lives, including those of 31 Americans. Most of the crashes were the result of the infamously bad German weather. It was a crazy approach to Tempelhof Airport. We had to come down right over these bombed out old buildings and come down very quickly and get on the ground. And with the load we had, it was a real challenge. Air Force Colonel Gail Haverson. Life during the airlift was hard for Berliners, especially during the winter when weather conditions made it very hard for planes to fly. Berliners everywhere were facing the winter with whatever means they could. For heat, they burned household furniture and trees, chopped down from parks. They scrounged in garbage cans for food, and according to some accounts, even ate city animals such as rodents or pigeons. It is in human nature, even when facing a catastrophe, to avoid thinking, I might be dead tomorrow, and instead to remember that one is alive. Had we not been able to obtain food, we would have been dead the following day. This is certain. The Soviets finally decided to lift their blockade on May 12, 1949, but the airlift continued until September 30, 1949, because the Allies felt it was necessary to build up a supply of food for Berlin. This was so that the Soviets could not attempt such a move again. In total, the U.S. delivered 1,783,572.7 tons, with 541,936.9 tons delivered by the British. This brings the total relief delivered to 2.3 million tons. All of this was accomplished on a total of 277,569 flights to Berlin. The Soviet government, using the harsh instrument of the blockade, has indeed chosen a strange way in Berlin to live up to its agreement to democratize German political life. Thanks to the air bridge and to the support given it by the Berliners, the Soviet government has not succeeded in its purpose. Now, Mr. President, as I pointed out to the Security Council before, we could have used our armed force against the Soviet threat, or we could have meekly submitted and surrendered our rights and duties in Berlin, subjecting nearly two and a half million Germans to Soviet rule with all that that implies. What we actually did is to live up to our obligations under the Charter of the United Nations. The Berlin Airlift was truly a triumph over tragedy in that it saved an entire city from a communist onslaught that could have ended in catastrophe. It demonstrated the resolve of the West and gave hope to a war-torn city. It also led to the formation of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, also known as NATO, in the following year, which today is responsible for peacekeeping in countries around the world, most recently in Afghanistan.